Hello, this is Jay. Welcome to Forbidden Files. You might be familiar with Sherlock Holmes, but did you know that Conan Doyle, who created the detective actually, was a detective of justice himself? This time, Jay is going to talk about Conan Doyle's very last investigation before his death. It is a 20-year-long unjust verdict that is both ridiculous and intricate, and it even seems more like a novel of Conan Doyle than reality. It is the murder of Oscar Slater. Nineteen twenty-five is the sixteenth year of Oscar Slater serving in Peterhead Prison, located in the northeast of Scotland. This prison was known for its cold, humidity, and harsh environment. Prisoners there were forced to work in wet markets and were even drugged to weaken their resistance. Prisoners' human rights were the least valuable here. Slater was on the verge of breakdown and suicide many times. His only hope was his family living on the German border of Poland. After his parents passed away, he started to write to his sister's children. Family was the only thing holding him up. He met William Gordon, another prisoner, at Peterhead Prison. William was released from Peterhead Prison in 1925, but nobody thought that the very first place he headed wasn't his home, but that of someone called Conan Doyle. Because a piece of waterproof paper was hidden in his dentures. It wrote, Please do what you can for me. Make the Scot know how you think of me. Please do not forget to write or see Conan Doyle. Why would Slater make his fellow prisoner see Conan Doyle? And what kind of crime did he commit? Let's start with a murder case. On the evening of December 21, 1908, Glasgow, Scotland. An eccentric, 83 years old woman, Miss Marion Gilchrist, was sitting in her room quietly as she always did for the past dozen years. She inherited her father's wealth and bought an apartment in the wealthy neighborhood of Glasgow. Living alone frightened her, so she installed a bunch of locks on her apartment door. Helen Lambie was the only maid she hired. That day of her murder, Helen was several minutes earlier to get the newspaper. Soon after, Arthur Adams, her neighbor downstairs, heard heavy knocks upstairs. He went upstairs and knocked on the door, but nobody answered, but some vague noises could be heard. Again there were knocks after he came home, and Arthur's sister urged him to check again. Right when he bumped into Helen, who had just come back, they caught sight of a man passing by. But neither of them was much alarmed, for this might be a tenant or a visitor. But when Helen opened the door, they were stunned by what was before. Miss Gilchrist was lying in a pool of blood, presumably dead. Her face had been battered and smashed, with some minor wounds on her body. Though frightened, they called the police immediately. After carefully examining the apartment, the police found that there were no signs of fight except the dining room, pieces of jewelry scattered on a dressing table. But most of them were left on the scene, which value about three pounds, zero, zero, zero in total. The only piece stolen was a 50 pounds brooch. The police were also surprised by Miss Gilchrist's private papers, scattered on the desk, apparently messed up by someone. They characterized it as a kill for money, hence the missing brooch was the major lead. Soon, the police received a report saying that a German Jew had been trying to sell a pawn ticket for a crescent brooch. He was Oscar Slater. He was born in a Jewish family in Germany, probably to shirk military service. Slater moved to London in about 1893, left two criminal records in Scotland. In order to survive and make some money, he started making illegal bets and changed a lot of aliases. Slater arrived at Glasgow in 1901 in a stylish Playboy image. He claimed to be a dentist and a precious stone dealer, under the alias of Anderson. The Glasgow police investigated Slater immediately. They found that he was living near Miss Gilchrist and just pawned a diamond brooch. He bought a small hammer before the murder, and pretty soon after, he sailed from Liverpool to New York in another alias. 
According to Helen, several days before the murder, Miss Gilchrist contacted a man called Anderson. The police put these leads together, believed that Slater was responsible for the murder. They telegrammed the American police about this case. To have Slater controlled right after he got off the steamer. The Scottish police, accompanied by three witnesses, arrived at Manhattan for the trial. But the defense attorney realized that prison evidence actually put Slater in advantage. The supposed murder weapon, the small hammer, seemed unable to cause Miss Gilchrist's wounds. As a precious stone dealer, Slater had pawned brooches several times. What's more, his pawn ticket was issued far earlier than the murder. That brooch was different from that of Miss Gilchrist, and his trip to America was arranged way before the murder. But the Scottish police insisted that Slater was guilty. To save his reputation, Slater waived his trial in America and consented to go on a trial again in Scotland. But this time, the trial ended in an entirely different way. May 3, 1909, the trial began in the High Court of Edinburgh. The judge was stubborn about class elitism, the prosecutor was under great pressure from public opinion, and even the jury was made up of agitated people. Just the atmosphere alone put Slater in disadvantage. The two witnesses who weren't so sure about Slater's guilt retracted their confessions. They stated categorically that he was the suspicious man they had seen, but were quiet about the discrepancy in the appearances. Surprisingly, none of those evidence in Slater's favor was presented. Information was scarce for the defense attorney. There was nothing he could do in this lopsided court. Hence, on May 6, 1909, Slater was sentenced to death. But the attorney believed that there was something wrong. He, Slater, and other attorneys turned in a petition appealing for lenient treatment. Eventually, two days before his execution, Slater was commuted to life in prison. Slater's life was saved by the attorney, but to find out the truth, he managed to reach out to Sir Conan Doyle. Conan Doyle wasn't in favor of the man himself, but apparently, Slater didn't kill Miss Gilchrist. In 1912, Conan Doyle published the case of Oscar Slater. He listed a bunch of bases of the trial and refuted them one by one, to argue that Slater was not the real killer. For instance, the reason why Slater used an alias to Ameriquasant for hiding from investigation, but for traveling with his mistress. He was hiding from his wife, not the police, and although Slater bought a small hammer, the size of it wasn't enough to cause Miss Gilchrist's wounds. Conan Doyle said, according to the forensic expert, the real murder weapon was a chair dripping blood on the center which wasn't even mentioned in the trial. Conan Doyle concluded that, because the eccentric Miss Gilchrist seldom left the apartment and there were no signs of forced entry. She apparently opened the door for the killer. She must knew and was well acquainted with the killer. But despite living nearby, Slater and Miss Gilchrist's paths never crossed. Conan Doyle's book made the public demand for a retrial, but the authorities insisted that these evidence were not enough for a retrial. In 1914, the clamor for a retrial grew louder. Detective Lieutenant of Glasgow City Police, John Thompson Trench revealed a vital information under great pressure, as he was among the officers who had investigated the murder. This information was from Margaret, Miss Gilchrist's niece. She said that Miss Gilchrist was about to change her will before her death, that Helen must had a clear view of the murder where one Helen knew and knew his name. John's dedication to reverse the verdict, together with Conan Doyle, and the people's will, made the authorities finally agree to initiate a hearing of investigation, right when people thought that the truth was about to come out and the justice was about to be upheld, the result was disappointing. This hearing was held by a novice judge and was closed to the public. It only focused on the evidence itself. The man Helen mentioned was a renowned upper class, with an invisible force hovering over all the compelling evidence. Both Helen and Margaret retracted their testimony, so does the police. Eventually, the judge announced that the case was free of suspicion and didn't need intervention, but John was dismissed from the force. Conan Doyle was infuriated by the result. 
He said, the verdict was incomprehensible. In my opinion, the whole case will remain immortal in the classics of Crimea's the supreme example of official incompetence and obstinacy. For years he raised this issue for a dozen of times, but wasn't successful. Let's look back to the beginning of this video. 1925, when Conan Doyle heard about the desperate plea in prison. He couldn't ignore the impulse of justice. He raised this issue again. He wrote to influential friends, the media, and even the Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald. He made public appearances to gather like-minded Piaplito fight against the power and uphold justice. They slowly began to gather stream. In 1927, a Glasgow journalist, William Park, published a book, The Truth About Oscar Slater. The book's deduction part agreed with Conan Doyle's former publication, but with more of that on the murderer. The murderer was arguing with Miss Gilchrist about her papers, when he accidentally injured her head, he then faced two options. Let his reputation ruined after she woke up and charged him with attack, or to kill her. Libel laws forbade William from naming the person in his book, but he believed that the murderer was the victim's nephew. The book caused a huge uproar. This time, the situation turned upside down, from the Secretary of State for Scotland to the public, they put pressure to the authority on this issue. November 8, 1927, the Secretary of Scotland stated that Ascar Slater had been serving in prison for 18 years, and he felt justified to authorize his release as soon as suitable managements can be made. Several days later, Slater was free temporarily, but noticed that he was released, not pardoned. This means that Slater was still guilty, he just got off prison. As far as Conan Doyle was concerned, this wasn't a perfect ending. He challenged the parliament by documenting Slater's case and gave it out to every members of the House of Commons. Finally, in June 8, 1928, he made Slater appeal against the judicial system. Conan Doyle and others gave money to Slater for his legal effies. July. This appeal finally succeed. Although the appeal judge didn't admit his misjudgment, he did admit that the jury's judgment might be misguided. Which led to a false verdict, Slater was finally cleared of the crime. The outcome was good enough for Conan Doyle, but not for Slater himself. He refused to accept the compensation, but take the £6.000 money from the Scotland government secretly, and were unwilling to pay his lawyer. Conan Doyle despised Slater's dishonorable actions, people who fought for him, had cost too much. For example, after Lieutenant Trench was dismissed, he was prosecuted by the top even in the military, and passed away in 1919. And two years after the final trial, Conan Doyle passed away too. While this unfortunate snob, Slater, escaped from the concentration camp and died of natural cause at his home in 1948, if Conan Doyle was still alive then, he would have disagreed with the newspaper, which wrote, Oscar Slater, dead at 78, murderer, friend of Conan Doyle.